Hey. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Hey, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. It looks lovely in North Carolina. Yes, it is. Don't you wish you moved here? Uh, Since you've already been here before? <laughs> I have to admit, we really liked it. It was pretty, yeah. pretty lovely. I had no idea you had a Duke connection. Uh, well, I mean, I was a graduate student there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I was looking up your LinkedIn page, and that's how I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. No, so we spent three years there. It was lovely. Yeah. How, when were you here? Uh, it's okay. You don't have to answer that question. I but I might ask you that in my, you know, in my, um, in the interview. Oh, well, then I better get it right. Um, <laughs> like I'm going to go look at LinkedIn. Uh, I, I believe it was 2006. Oh, that? wow. Okay. Okay. Not that long uh, ago. All right. Um, did you want to first talk about the pocket colposcope or after we end? Because I, I, either way is fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I did just check. It's 2006. I literally okay. I feel like sometimes I'm just recycling little gray cells. Like, wait, I know. Wait, wait. I know. Me uh, too. And I can't believe that it's been that long. Yeah. I don't remember anything yesterday that I did yesterday. Um, I was just going to read your, your experience right from the website, like via Global Health, you know, your CEO and co-founder and what it briefly does. And then I literally was just going to start from like, you know, distribution 101 because <laughs> part of what I'm trying to do is um, sort of share with people some of the questions we have and we don't always know things and students don't always know how this works and it's really nice to be able to break it down and you know we talked with various people we interviewed about other aspects of global health right like how is COVID impacting that um, what is the role of telemedicine um, what are some policy issues that, you know, could take away from, you know, cancer uh, care? So, so different sort of angles to address the, both the, the processes and the challenges to, you know, implementing global health solutions. And so, um, yeah, that, that was sort of the gist of what I was thinking. And I don't have questions like written down. I tend to be a little bit more spontaneous if you're okay with that. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, you sound like you would be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you seem very relaxed. So, so I don't, oh, Alexandria is here because Alexandria, I, uh, Alexandria is in my group and she's amazing because this was sort of her um, brainchild. And um, Alexandria, I don't see you. Oh, my video is not on right now, but I'm right here. Um, and I was just checking in to see if you needed anything before you start, but the Zoom is recording. Oh, it is. So what do I do? Just, um, just keep talking and then. Yeah. So then whenever I'm... you feel ready to start with the questions, you can just go ahead and start. Um, and okay. then we'll be editing it after. Okay. So I introduce myself, I introduce Noah and then, um, just get started. Yeah. And I'll just be here listening. Oh, great. Does, great. Does it sound okay? I had a call it's, earlier and nobody could hear anything. It sounds great. That was another thing I was just checking. It sounds great. I can see both of you. So that's perfect. Yeah, and I wore my whole headgear. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like I should you, my background. I should wear a mask and a headgear. That would <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yeah. No, let's just do the headgear for today, one step at a time. So yeah, this is weird, like not being able to do this in person. I have to say, like it takes me a bit of time to warm up this idea that I'm talking to a screen. Um I, I, I don't know if you ever watch um Trevor Noah, but he was interviewing oh, is that better? Yeah. Oh, so you know what? We have comparable backgrounds now. Yeah. <laughs> what, Trevor Noah was interviewing who? Uh, John Stewart. And uh -huh. John Stewart was having issues with the whole Zoom thing and like always looking at himself instead of looking at the camera. And <laughs> that was weird. But here's the thing, though. Um, this was pre-recorded. So, so we can't. We, we're doing that because of, I guess, Zoom bobbing. We don't want, you know, I, I gave a talk once where in the middle it was like all profanity and stuff. So, really? yeah, yeah. So we changed our mind about how we do this. All right. Shall we get started? Excellent. Yeah, no, please. Okay. So, Alexandria, I'm just going to start and you'll edit as you see fit, right? Yep. Sounds great. All right. 
Um, hi, I'm Nimi Ramanujam, um, professor of biomedical engineering and global health at Duke University. And um, I'm really pleased to have uh, Noah Perrin here as one of our um, WISH interviewees um, and be able to talk to him about a very important um, issue in global health, which is um, distribution of technologies to uh, various parts of the world to address global health issues. So he is uh, the CEO and co-founder of VIA Global Health, which is a distribution platform for high impact healthcare technologies to sustainably, affordably, and quickly access and address the health needs of a global population, uh, particularly in emerging markets. Um, welcome, Noah. Uh, great to be able to talk to you today. So um, I'm a student of um, many uh, issues related to sustainability and scaling of global health solutions. And um, I really wanted to start um, at the very beginning. Um, what inspired you to start Via Global Health? Yeah, no, it was, um, so I spent, prior to Via, I, I spent six years at the Global Health NGO PATH, which is how we first met. And PATH you know, focuses on how to develop and scale up and, and just get out into the hands of people that need them, high impact health technologies. And during my tenure there, what I found was that, you know, though incredible resources and you know, passion and investment was going into the development of impactful health technologies, many of them just weren't actually getting to where they were needed. Um, they weren't scaling. Uh, people, you know, ultimately, though we would be successful in the development and the pilot introductions and building the evidence, there was this massive gap around, you know, awareness. How do, how do people even know that these new technologies exist? And, you know, the next piece of that is once they know they, they exist, how do they get them? Um, and how do you help facilitate that? And so where that was a, a common challenge for many of these innovations, um, it seemed like there was an opportunity to help bridge that gap. And that's why you know, I, I ultimately left PATH and founded VIA uh, to be a distribution platform, uh, essentially the channel for innovations so that they can get out into the world and be utilized and, and, and realize the impact that you know, we all sort of hope that they'll be able to achieve. That's great. How, how long has VIA existed? <laughs> uh, it's been quite a journey so far. Uh, I left PATH in 2015, um, so we're in our fifth year. And things really started to pick up around 2017. Um, I think it's been it's been a learning journey in terms of, you know, it's certainly the, the domain and, mm -hmm. and how distribution works and what our customers need and, and, and quite frankly, who our customers are. Mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the biggest philosophical pivots is that we came to it thinking that, you know, how do we help innovators and manufacturers of, of impactful technologies reach hard to reach markets? Like that's why we came into existence. And what we found you know, over the course of the years was that probably the real opportunity is how do we support buyers of these technologies um, and really help them identify and get access to the information so that they can make an informed purchase decision, um, give them purchasing power so that in underserved communities, um, you know, what we found is that they're largely ignored. Like there's massive fragmentation in these markets. I mean, there's like, 54 countries in Africa. Um, as a result, a lot of these markets are quite small and manufacturers can't focus on them all or, or respond to the needs in all these different markets. So you know, our, our pivot has been perhaps a little bit about you know, not just focusing on how to support manufacturers, but how do we support our customers, um, you know, local distributors, NGOs, anybody who's buying within these countries to be able to really help facilitate that and, and reduce that friction. Got it. So you've talked about how VIA plays a critical role in impact. Um, yeah, so I'm at home and my dogs are barking, of course, because they want to join the conversation. Um, <laughs> I got two dogs, so double the noise. Yeah. Um, so 
I'm just going to pause for a second so that we don't have this noise and Alexandra can edit it. Okay. Um, I guess I can, I can probably finish while you're on mute. Probably the other part of that journey has really been on the entrepreneurial side. So like understanding what it takes to build a business has been probably another big part of that five years um, and sort of building those teams. Um, I know you know, you're, you're do it as well. Um, but when my, my previous background was always from large organizations, PATH, Microsoft and others, um, you know, building a team where now 10 of us, uh, but you know, building that up has, has been quite the, the learning journey as well. I'm going to kill my husband. Hold on. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't know. Alexandra, do we get to, do you get to edit out the admission of guilt? Yeah, um, there's two of us that will be working on the editing. Um, it's a science for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lovely background. I, I feel like I should improve mine. Yeah, I think that's at her house, actually. Is that a window? Or just, is she outside? I think she might be outside. So are, are you in Durham at the moment as well? I'm in Durham as well, yeah. How, how are things there? Um, they're not bad. Um, people are wearing masks, so that's good. Oh, that's good. That's Staying good. inside. Um, none of us have gone back to the office yet, so yeah. just hang out. And where are you located? Uh, outside of Seattle. Okay. So it, it actually just became a state mandate starting today that everybody outside must wear masks. Oh, wow. So it'll be I guess that's really good, though. It is. I, I'm curious to see what the compliance on that will be. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't kill him, but I maimed him for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We got a chance to... <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so mad. Um, but anyway... Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so you were saying that part of this is entrepreneur, entrepreneurial in that you have to build a business. It's not just enough to say, we need to create this distribution platform, but we need to figure out how to optimize that process. So can you actually tell me, sorry, could you tell me a little bit about that, about that process? So imagine I knew nothing about you know, evidence to impact, right? And you're sort of a critical piece, Via is a critical piece of that path. Can you just tell me how these connections are made? Because I imagine you have the person who has the innovation and hopefully the evidence. And then on the other side, you have the customer that's reaching the population. What happens in between? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there's, there's quite a few steps. I, because we, we are that sort of middleware um, organization. And, you know, I think there's, there's filtering that's happening on both ends in terms of identifying those manufacturers that do have evidence uh, to support their innovation that that have commercially like ready products. That's actually one of the biggest challenges is making sure that as we start to promote and build awareness that the devices are truly ready. Um, I think that's that's been again part of that journey. Um, you know, everybody is going through it, especially on the smaller organizations. Um, you know, it, it's different to you know, supply devices for a clinical trial or evaluation purposes. But now you have to start to scale up for other, you know, for the, the broader public. And what does that mean for your labeling, for your manufacturing, for you know, training and things of that nature? So there's a lot of filtering that happens on that side. There's filtering that's happening on the side of, the, of our customer. You know, are they an organization? You know, uh, are they an organization that normally trades and imports vehicles and they've decided that they really want to do medical equipment? You're like, well, probably not a good fit for you know, this market and, and what we're trying to do. So we have to screen some of those players out. Um, we're working with different NGOs who may or may not have the ability to import products. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the first piece of it is how do we, how do we do that screening? and do it systematically um, and, and do it as efficiently as possible. We have hundreds of customers now. Um, you know, we've delivered product to 65 countries um, and growing. And you know, those products have touched the lives of, of over a million and a half patients. So it, like, I feel like, like the, the burden of, of impact is growing and it's like, we have to be really good at what we do in terms of being able to screen efficiently. Um, so there's that selection process, that's the first one. 
and then it's you know helping to bridge that gap by by facilitating um, you know the, the purchase and, and well, first the awareness uh, across the board so that people know what's available giving them the information that that's actually been a one of our key areas of focus is how do we how do we present the information that people need to be able to buy um, and and to make an informed decision like what what is it that people that the buyers actually are looking for yeah you know, they're looking for warranty information that's probably one of the first requests we get they're looking for brochures and you know the the brochures can't be written um, like a USAID proposal. Like they actually have to be written for a customer so that it explains the value proposition of this device and how it's used and, and why they should buy it. Um, and then it's helping to facilitate sort of those other steps. Like how do you ship something to Kenya? Um, and, and what are those important steps on for both the supplier, like Kenya's Kenya is a special case. You actually have to do an inspection before anything leaves wherever it's coming from, uh, before it arrives in Kenya. Um, some some countries, you know, most countries that's not the case. Uh, Nigeria does their inspection, you know, when it arrives. So you have to understand all those different dynamics and make sure that, like, if you're going to ship something to Kenya, you can't just send it and then expect it to clear if you haven't done these other steps. So for us, it's about how do we understand all those different logistics uh, challenges and opportunities. And then the, the transaction, like how do you, how does somebody pay for the product? Um, it, it's sometimes as easy as, you know, paying on a credit card, um, though that's not our preferred modality. Uh, generally it's wire transfer, but in, you know, in Zimbabwe right now, you can't get money out of the country um, electronically they just have a backlog. And so our customers there, in order to get the supplies that they need, will literally fly to Johannesburg and you know, provide a big wad of cash that we have to figure out how to process. Um, so I think it's those steps that really help facilitate and, and that you have to understand to be able to sort of get those products you know, where they need to go. And there, there's definitely nuance for every market, for every product. Um, and we're still learning, like, how do we promote products effectively and what different channels can we use uh, to get it out and target the right audiences? Great. Um, thank you. I, I have a couple more questions that perhaps are, are should be separate, but I'd ask you both of them. So one of the most important things um, in order to create market demand, and, and clearly you have, but the question is, um, how do you build a trust of your customer base, right? Because to really get the, the, the impact you want, uh, and you clearly know how to do it if you have already touched so many people through Via Global Health. How do you, yeah, uh, get the trust of your customer base so that they're saying, okay, this is the go-to place um, to basically get what I need? We, we, we talked about that a lot recently. Um, like, what is that Sort of secret sauce and i think it's building those meaningful customer relationships i think you know, as i've as it's evolved you know originally the intent was that we would be like amazon you know you just put it up there and people buy it and it's all self-serve and, and what we've learned is that while that you know ultimately may be the case um that element of trust is critical like people people want to know that you know, they're, they're spending a lot of money. Um, I mean, our average order value is not $25, it's thousands of dollars. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of money to send to somebody who you've never met or never seen. And so we've learned a lot about, you know, again, we, we have an office in Johannesburg where we have our sales team located because our customers wanted to know that we were committed to the continent and that we had people there that they could call. Um, we meet them where, you know, through whatever modality they, they need. Like, is it a phone call? Is it WhatsApp? Um, is it email? Again, part of what we do is to just be as responsive as we can to again, build that trust. Um, and, and that's been a major challenge just in the, just sort of in, in this ecosystem in general. Like responsiveness, it's just a, a tough thing in general. Um, like a lot of people don't respond or you know, aren't following through on, on a lot of you know, the different steps that they need. So that reliability is, is generally not there. So that's something that we really focus on. Like if, if we say we're doing it, we're getting it there, you know, come hell or high water, we have their back. Um, 
and we respond and I, you know, we actually measure like how responsive are we on, a, on any given basis. For instance, recently with COVID, um, our quote requests have gone up 800%. And so our sales team, which is only three people, uh, were just being inundated. And what we, you know, we saw that our response time was slipping and, you know, we, we had to really focus on that. Um, Cause I think that that becomes part of our value proposition is how do we build that trust in those relationships? I think it's great to hear that both you're sort of taking this human centered design approach where you're constantly iterating to really meet the needs of your customer. And you're also taking this very quantitative approach to measure impact and then use that to feed back into um, how you improve what you do. Um, so I, I just think that those two things are awesome to, to hear about. Um, I guess, you know, one of the questions that I have as it relates to that is, um, and maybe I shouldn't use Amazon as the example, but do you have competitors? I mean, to me, it sounds like Via Global Health is pretty special, but I'm curious, are there other companies, other organizations that are doing similar things and what are you doing that is unique about Via Global Health? And maybe the answer is, there is no one else, but I thought I'd ask. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think our, our, our key competitor is really the status quo of, you know, either healthcare providers just not having access to what they need. Like, they just have come to accept it. They're like, you know what? I can't get it. I'm, you know, I might've been trained on those tools, but I don't know, you know, I don't know how to get them, so I just will do without. And, and I think that that's probably the biggest one is just to let people know, like, no, actually, like, we exist to provide you access. Like, let's change that mindset. Let's, let's get these things to you. Um, I mean, there are other, certainly other marketplaces. Alibaba sells medical equipment. Um, you, know, you can you can buy anything on Alibaba, I think. Um, there's, you know. The uh, Africa CDC has scaled up a supply platform specifically around COVID um, that we're actually looking to see if we can help support uh, because we have a lot of the infrastructure in place to be able to help, you know, select, um, you know, qualified suppliers and, and, you know, understand that, that, that aspect of it um, pretty effectively. Um, certainly, you know, UNICEF and WHO, UNICEF has their supply catalog. We, we speak with them. Um, you know, and, and have had discussions about how can we also help support them. A, a lot of these, um, I, I don't really want to call them competitors because I, I feel like we really don't compete um, because really in the, for the most part, like, you know, the CD, the Africa CDC platform, uh, UNICEF, they're, they're focused on the public sector. Um, like they, they look at how do they get product and, you know, for governments and, and, Sort of through those tender processes and that supply chain. While our customers are are certainly private sector customers for the most part, there's you know, NGOs and faith-based organizations as well, and they may serve the public sector um, because a lot of normal tenders do go through sort of local distributors um, and, and local agents. Um, so, so I do feel like we're sort of supplementing what some of these big organizations are doing as well. Um, in, in many ways, we have sort of more granular reach, I would say, than they do. Um, and then, you know, Alibaba, like I said, exists, but they just kind of bring the two parties together and say, you know, go, go forth. Like, you know, in, in the case of buying something in Kenya, you know, they're not going to set up the pre-export verification inspection. Like, they're just like, you figure it out. So there's no efficiencies there. Um, so I think that that's, we, you know, to your point, we are kind of unique in this space at the moment. Um, you know, maybe that won't be the case in a few years, but for the time being, I think, um, you know, we, we've had some room to be able to figure out how to make this work because there's, there aren't other entities breathing down our necks. And it's great to have these best practices because, you know, it's very hard to figure these things out and you're creating sort of this model and understanding the nuances. So that's also incredibly valuable, um, you know, in case you write a book. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> um, so I want to now pivot towards COVID. You brought that up. And, you know, one of the concerns I imagine in a global health setting is what about the supply chain? You know, are we going to be able to get the things we want? And um, not that that isn't a problem, you know, 
during regular times, but this is amplified. See, on the one hand, you're, um, the demand has gone up, but on the other hand, if you're looking for things that you can get to your customers, there's got to be a bottleneck. So how do you balance that? Because you have huge demand, but I imagine the supply probably can't keep pace with well, that. I, I mean, I think it's, it's even more acute. Like you said, it's amplified because it's happening at a global level. So our customers now are competing against the U.S. and Europe. Like, um, you know, everybody's trying to, uh, you know, it, in, in March and February, everybody's trying to buy the same ventilators. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really hard. Like we were, you know, our customers who are, you know, already smaller buyers and we're trying to aggregate and, and, and pool that demand are competing against, you know, the state of California for the exact same devices. Yeah. Um, and you know, California can pay cash and they want, you know, they don't care what it costs. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that, that made it particularly hard. Like what we found yeah. was on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the lead times were increasing dramatically, availability was decreasing and prices were going up. Um, yeah. Everybody was bidding against them, you know, each other. Um, I think that's where, you know, the, where you see organizations like the Africa CDC coming in and saying, look, we'll, we'll do it for the continent. I think that is huge. Like that needed to happen. It needed to happen here in the U S. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that, that they actually were able to pull that together. Um, yeah. I think, you know, what we've also seen sort of the, the other ramifications have been on the logistics um, supply chain uh, or the mm -hmm. aspects of it. Um, and we spoke with, with some of the, the big carriers, you know, that have their own planes, like the DHL and the UPSs, and still about half of their capacity is commercial airliners, and those planes aren't flying. <clears throat> so they're, they're highly capacity constrained, and the costs have just gone exponential um, in terms of how do you get materials, you know, PPE from China to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you, you can't put it on a boat because you can't wait 45 days. Um, and, you know, again, these countries, you know, these underserved countries are, are, are being hit even harder because you know, they, might, they might fly planes from China to Europe or even you know, China to South Africa, but nobody's flying to Namibia. So mm. how, do you, how do you get it to those even sort of more underserved countries? And, and that's been a huge challenge for us. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate, right? Because we, this, the, I, I don't know if we can say this, but it almost sounds like um, socioeconomically disadvantaged communities or locations, maybe, and I don't know if that's accurate, maybe suffer more from lack of access to these solutions, right? Because I imagine if it's a bidding war, uh, some uh, customers are able to pay more than others. And that just sort of eliminates a certain customer base. Um, so, and also there's I imagine that, yeah. 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 And then I also imagine that places like a dual burden on you, because you talked about being, you know, the responsiveness to your customer, which is critically important. But on the other hand, you're also having to uh, keep up with the demand and making sure you're meeting those. So it sounds like you have... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, sorry. April. Yeah, April was tough. April was our biggest sales month ever because we were delivering masks and gowns and, and other things that people needed. But we were also holding to that commitment when it came to the shipping, and shipping was literally doubling, you know, every yeah. seven days. And generally, you know, the freight forwarders would hold to, yeah, you know, they would quote us and they would hold to that quote for at least ten days, and they. would you know, even the big ones like UPS said basically, no, we're not, I, we don't understand what's happening in the world. If you don't mm. buy at that moment, it's off the table. Um, and so we would, you know, our customers would make a purchase, we'd arrange for all the shipping and suddenly, you know, the shipping would be double. And it was like, we can't go back to them and say, sorry, like we made a commitment to you, but you know, we thought we had a commitment from these other organizations and they've totally reneged. Like some, at some point, the buck has to stop somewhere, and yeah. we ended up eating those costs. Um, so, what would have wow. been our best month ever, dramatically, like 
point of profitability, mm. you know, ended up being, we were still contribution positive, but, but nowhere near to the degree. Wow. That, uh, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, so oh, there's my I have, <laughs> <laughs> how can you do without dogs during this period? Um, I have to, you know, I, I think about this one question that was sort of kept coming up in my mind as you were talking, which is, it sounds like, I mean, I'm personally interested in this idea, which is you not only serve customers, but you're sort of connecting customers to innovators or manufacturers. And sometimes you might have a customer that's asking for something that you simply don't have. Does that then create ideas for innovation or new needs that can then sort of maybe not go back to the same manufacturer, but create this um, space for people to sort of say, hey, Noah, I, I didn't know this was a need because oftentimes, you know, you think of pushing technologies to people, but how nice if people actually need something but doesn't exist right. um, so that you can actually um, fuel innovation as a result of these very important connections that you've made. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think we think of it as, as giving, you know, a, a key stakeholder group a voice. Um, I mean, I think certainly healthcare providers, when I worked at PATH, you know, we would go and meet with healthcare providers and, you know, try out their, you know, work with them to figure out sort of what, what the needs were. Um, but we're actually working with another group of stakeholders, which are generally the local distributors or the people who are, who are responsible for selling the devices. Um, and I think that that gives you a very different perspective. Um, it, it, it enables you to, I think when you go to a healthcare provider and you're like, look, this is this amazing thing that, you know, you said you had this issue, we figured out how to solve it. Um, like, yeah, that's great, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you talk to the people who have to sell it, you can mm -hmm. differentiate between the need and the demand. Because those people who are on the ground who understand the markets, who understand sort of what those actual substitutes are and what people are truly doing, um, you know, it, you can get from them sort of that input about like, okay, well, what, you know, what features actually are you being asked for? Or, you know, we thought it was a problem, but people have kind of figured out a way around it. And, you know, even though they're, they might like something a little bit differently, it's not really a hyper, like they're not demanding it. Um, mm. it, it it's a need. There's no question it's a need, but it's not something that's going to be prioritized. Um, okay. Or paid for. And, and I think that's where it, it's sort of that, that differentiate, differentiation between need and demand. Like what is somebody willing to pay for in terms of features? And I think that's where yeah. we've been able to work with a lot of pre-commercial entities. Um, we actually had funding through um, uh, the Saving Lives at Birth uh, Consortium with USAID and, and others to work with some of their grantees and, and basically conduct focus groups with our, our customers, wow. our contributors, and say, look, here's here's this new feature that's coming or new device. You know, what what resonates? What what's going to be a problem? What you know, where do you see the opportunity? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it could be a business model opportunity. It could be a feature set opportunity. Um, uh -huh. A lot of people who are like, you know, everybody wants every investor wants a SaaS model. You know, software as a service. We'll give away the device, and we'll it'll all be about yeah. the data. And you start talking to our customers, and they're like, how would how would we sell that? Um, you know, it's not like you can just put a twenty-five dollar a month credit, you know, recurring credit card charge. Um, you know, we're going to have to pay for it by wire transfer, and that's going to cost us twenty-five bucks a month. Um, like, how how that's is it going to work? Um, or or how is it going to be packaged? You know, we had one example of a manufacturer who, you know, had their the replacement parts. Uh, it was a consumable, and they basically just had it. As like you could buy, you know, the piece that the whole consumable was made up of like twenty different pieces, and you could just buy them all individually, and you know, pick the ones that you wanted. And when we offer people that many options, they're like, I have no idea. Like, I don't even know what I don't even know what these things are. Um, and we we were able to work with them to repackage it, and it, it's the same product, same you know, coming off the factory the exact same way. We just now offered on the site as like, you know the whole consumable, you know, this is, this is the whole pack. It's ready to go. You know, you can treat X number of patients with this package and that people are like, got it. 
that's clear. Um, and, and so being able to think about the business model innovation, the product innovation, the packaging innovation, um, our, our, our customers, to your point, like they want to provide feedback because you know, they, they want products that can be successful as well. Yeah, it seems like the business models um, that you're talking about is, are almost orthogonal <laughs> to the way we do business in the United States, where you know the razor razor blade model is kind of the way to sustain a business. So th that's a really important thing to know because it's hard to sort of extrapolate from the way things are done here to how things might be done in different environments. So um, in closing, I want to ask you a question. So I'm an educator at a university, and I have a lot of students who are very interested in global health, but sometimes I feel like they sort of know the academic side. You know, I'm going to, here's a problem, here's a solution, and then they graduate. <laughs> and um, we don't really necessarily teach them the processes for impact. And maybe it's, you know, beyond the scope because there's, it's so nuanced and there's so many pieces. But what is something that you might share with students from your perspective and your experience in global health as some key elements to think about? And, and remember, these are Duke students and you're a Duke alum. So right. you're obligated to say a few things about that. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but anyway. I mean, I think, not, not to sound like a broken record, but I think one of the key lessons that I've learned through Global Health and my experience you know, working for an NGO and now you know, being a, a small business and an entrepreneur is, is the necessity to be able to differentiate between need and demand. I think that we all, like we all know the data exists for like where babies are dying. Um, and sort of why. And you know, we all want to be able to help solve that problem. But I think we also need to be able to look at it from the lens of, well, you know, culturally or socioeconomically, or like, why is that happening? And is it something that people, you know, don't have the tools for, or they're just not prioritizing? Um, because you, know, you can't bring a, an amazing technology solution into a you know, community that, that kind of doesn't care. Like maybe that's just not their priority. Like they're focused on vaccines right now. You know, they're not focused on preterm births and that might be the most important thing to you, but it may not be the most important thing to them at, at this point in time. Um, and I think it's it, where I found the most satisfaction is being able to find those opportunities where there is that latent demand where people recognize the issue, recognize and are willing to prioritize it. Um, and that, that's where things happen. Otherwise, I think you're, you're basically pushing on a string. And that's, you know, ultimately, it might make you feel good for a little while, but it's not super satisfying because you're not working with the community and, and you know, being able to solve their problems. I, I feel like sometimes we solve our problems. Yeah. So customers are essentially the most important in mm -hmm. this equation. That's really, at the end of the day, what drives the pull instead of the push. Yeah, and I have to say that um, that is a very academic problem, right? It's like textbook or paper driven where you see a problem and you think of a solution, but there's this huge gap in implementation and impact. So I really appreciate that, you know, that's sort of a, a fundamental tenet of being able to successfully implement uh, global health technologies. Um, so yeah, those are my questions. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to learn so much about this process. I'm still a novice. So um, I think not only is this useful to people listening, but I, you know, I'm constantly being educated about the, the, the things that you have to care about to make um, uh, technologies um, meaningful and impactful. So this is great. And uh, I'm so excited to be talking to a Duke alum. Um, <laughs> I should have worn my so, Duke hat or something. Yeah, <laughs> or at least a Duke hat. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Noah. This was, uh, this was great. And um, I, I'm sure that um, this will be very informative to the audiences who listen. So definitely. I, I mean, I, the last piece to throw out there, you know, as an alum, but just in general, I think as people have questions, uh, I'm always happy to, to speak with folks and and just dive in. Like if they have, you know, their question or an innovative technology or something that they, career advice, whatever it may be, um, I'm always happy to, to pay, it, pay it back.
Right. So now that you said that, um, how do they contact you? <laughs> um, probably the easiest way is by email. Uh, so okay. Noah at theglobalhealth.com. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, that, that's great. Um, so that it's not like, oh, I heard all this stuff, but what do I do? Um, great. Um, I think. Thank you, guys. That was fantastic. Do I need to end on a more professional note? Because I just said, well, that's it. No, that's totally <laughs> fine. Um, we will add an ending to it. And um, Noah, what we'll do is send you a copy of the video once it has been edited um, in case you need it for anything else as well, too. Wonderful. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Alexandria. Noah, did you still want to talk about the stuff that we discussed by email or do you want to do it another time? Um, I mean, real quickly, I, I guess my question is, I mean, we don't have to have sort of the evaluation device or devices. Um, I'll talk to our sales group, uh, Riza in South Africa, because um, I know that they've been fielding a lot of interest in coproscopes at the moment. And it's- I'm surprised given the fact that they are, you know, not able to get around. Um, huh, interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, people are still, you know, quote requests are still coming in. Um, wow. Still happening. I, I mean, I think people have budgets to spend. So oh, I see. And so, okay, got it, got it. I was curious, actually, can you, this sounds like a, a little cheesy, but you know, like if I want to buy an apartment, right? Sometimes they, you know, um, have you buy it up front or have you at least know about it so that when or when it's going to come out and so to sort of stay tuned. Right. Is that, I mean, we know that it's going to come by come out by the end of the year, these 80 units, though, of course, I mean, if, if the supply chain issues, you know, we don't have any control. Um, so I was just, I'm, I'm just curious because it seems like we're getting ready to have these units disseminated. And I personally don't know that there's a mark. I mean, I don't know that people are demanding a colposcope, right? I mean, you do, but I'm yeah. like, oh, what happens after the 80? So yeah, I was just curious because when they show up, is that when you say, hey, look, there's one, or if they have budgets to spend, do you say, well, look, this is coming at this point in time, we'll, we'll send you some things ahead of time to see what you think. I, so that was just a question because I'm trying to figure out how to move forward once we have something in our hands. Because do I just say, hey, Noah, we're ready? Or is there some sort of preamble or pre-steps that there are definitely some pre-steps i think you know it, it's it's good to get in the queue for the product page build so that it's ready so that we're ready when you're ready um okay. and part of that now uh so we've been we've been like i said part of the learning journey um how do we how do you start promoting these things and um so we're getting better at that as well uh, and and so we'll actually kick off after you know, as new products come on, we actually now have a process for like kicking off advertising for a certain period oh. of time, um, just to start building again, building awareness. Um, and and so when does that, that happen? Does that does that happen like say three months before, two months before? So I think literally, I think we're trying to figure out. Okay, if it's December, when do we need to start the processes, yeah. and what does that entail? So that we can almost like I don't know if you have a template, but something that we can just be primed for because. We want to be ready, obviously. Uh, and then, of course, there's these 20 units that we're expecting by September. Now, that those, so many of those are slated for clinical studies, but I think like a couple of them or three of them we can get out. And they could even be sort of recycled if that was something um, that was of interest. But we just want to meet your needs and your customers' needs. So we wanted to be able to both be flexible, but also be ready uh, for when that happens. So I think we would probably stage it. So I think there's... It'd be great. I mean, I'll talk to Riza and, and just get his thoughts too. He's our sales manager in South Africa. Um, but it'd probably be good to be able to, I think it is almost like seeding the market. Like if we have one that people can just try because people are, people are already using, you know, some of the other devices. Um, yeah. And they're just hard to get. Um, so I think giving it, you know, if there's one, we, we wouldn't even, you know, it, they get to borrow it. <laughs> Like we want it back. Yeah, exactly. We want it back. Um, and, and I don't that, even need it back, but I mean, it's probably more of a liability, right? Because if they keep it, you know, it's it's just it, it sets precedent. If they use it, there's a problem, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I was thinking, like, our colposcopes last a long time. 
Um, they literally do. We've done studies in eight countries with 30 colposcopes. So um, the question, oh, there's a wasp. Um, so, yeah, if, if you wanna just, you know, an email say, these are the stages, be prepared for this, then we could do our part um, to be ready. And uh, we can certainly, you know, give you some devices that you could sort of test and say, okay, here, you know, you can borrow this for X amount of time. And maybe we'll give you three so you can have, I, mean, I don't know where you're getting the request from, but if it's like a few countries where you're getting continued um, requests versus like five countries, that probably makes it easier, right? Because you can focus on those priority countries. So yeah, I'm kind of excited because um, Robert's been designing Final sort of version, version that has taken the feedback of now, you know, people from eight countries. Now they're not sort of voting sort of input. Oh, I'm losing your audio. It got all buzzy. No, oh, it's gone. It, it sounds all staticky. <laughs> With that? Better? I can hear you now. I can't hear you. Oh my God. <laughs> oh now? my God. I accidentally um, hit the mute button at the bottom. <laughs> Okay, I need to get my act together. Yeah, um, so we also understand that just because we've gotten all this input, it doesn't mean that people aren't gonna have more from a market perspective, right? Like workflow and blah, blah, blah. So that's why we're building these 80 units to sort of say, and they're gonna be manufactured in ISO certified facilities, so they could be sold. Um, the first 20 though are not gonna be, um, I mean, they're going to be built in an ISO certified place, but I don't think that's a wise to sell them. I think it's better to use them to kind of get feedback. So right. um, position them as sort of non-clinical, for, not for clinical about use, but for evaluation. Yeah, people, yeah. I mean, they can use it. In a, I mean, they can use yeah. it, but they can't, you know, tell us or we're not we're not saying they can be they can certainly use it in research studies if they want to like all they want but it can't be um you know we're gonna start making decisions about patients with this device um one of the things i quickly wanted to ask you was we struggle with this uh, disposable sheath versus because it goes inside right the re the the, the vagina versus like mobile ODT or gynocular, but that's in a sense what makes it so low cost, right? Because we can sell it, let's say we wanted to do 2X, right? We could probably sell it for, you know, over $500 or $600. Of course, that's gonna change with increasing volumes, but initially, and we're not expecting to like be sustainable. We, we understand that, you know, we probably wanna give it at cost initially to people to try it out until, um, I, I don't know, you, you might you might give me more advice on that, but that's what we were thinking just because we don't want to start out with, you know, you have to pay a lot of money for this. Not that it would be a lot more, but to meet people where they are. But again, I'm not the expert, um, but we're expecting it to be about $700, $800 at, at most. And um, the thing that we don't have and we've been struggling with is people tell us we don't want a disposable. That's a, that's a crazy thing. We can't you know, we're, we're going to end up with a risky situation where people end up using it again and again. And then the other hand, people are like, we want a disposable. So it's like, how do you, and so we know we need that option, but we haven't solved that problem. And my question is, in your experience, is that something we need to do or should we wait based on the feedback so we're not wasting our time creating something that may not add value? So it's kind of a fine balance between what we think should be ready versus what we think you know, could wait. And I've talked to Dean Wallace, who, you know, his thermocoagulators, and he said people use, you know, they're used to disinfecting his thermocoagulators. They're not frequent, they're not used as frequently, but they, he said, nonetheless, I mean, he actually now gives them like a little uh, document that says, you know, you don't reuse, we've got it approved for Cydex or whatever, but here's something called 
it starts with a P, permata or something that can be easily used in hot water to do the same thing in eight minutes. So, you know, he said he's had workarounds when there have been problems. I, I don't know what the name of it is, but apparently in, in African countries, that's very routinely used to disinfect a variety of things that are used in the body. So it's not like something they're not used to. So yeah, that's, that's my thought process. And even speculums, right? They have a bunch of them. And I know the thermocoagulator, they have a bunch of tips. Ours is like one solid unit, so we can't just take the tip off. Right. So that's what the main thing I wanted to ask you, because if that's something you deem, and I don't know, you don't have that customer feedback, but from your experience, if you think that's important, then we need to start addressing that issue now, which is a design issue, right? Because we can't cover the tip, because that's going to be a problem, but we'd certainly put something like a sheath on around it so that it minimizes uh, contamination. So that was my only big question, the stages so that we can be ready. And the second is, in your experience, should we just, and I, and I don't want you to feel like you're trapped with that question, but do you, um, do you say, wait, Nemi, let's just figure it out with the three units or whatever, or that's critical because you don't want the you don't want to be dead on arrival you want you know you don't want people to be discouraged by the fact that um it doesn't fit in their workflow we've never had a problem with it before with any of our our collaborators right now it's not it doesn't have the sheath right it's all no but it's easy i mean i could just take i mean we've actually taken like tubing that's perfectly fits the diameter and it basically just extends out a little bit from the tip so it doesn't cover the tip but it extends out so that essentially like 99 percent of it is covered but then you have the optical tip that can't be without getting a blurred image and so we would have to make that device more expensive if we did do that because it it would just be more and so we're trying to balance cost with a with a with a sort of an interim solution or a makeshift solution versus here's this device that has you know this disposable and you can easily you know remove the optical part i mean have the optical part connected to it because that creates i mean if you think about it that's what makes products expensive right the more bells and whistles you add the more expensive it's going to get and i think it's the balance of what people can afford and what people would like and i think so i'm gonna i'm gonna punt and say i don't know okay However, <laughs> um, I, I think there are clear things that make products that on arrival, like creating one that, you know, is for community health workers and only works on an iPhone. Like that's just dumb. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, I, I, I would want, I think ultimately the market has to be able to, to tell you, like, you know, you need the data and like to your point, like the Copascope, you know, mobile DTs doesn't have that. Yeah. Like people seem fine with it. Um, and I think that there's really, there's a lot more, like there's additional cost to having a consumable, but there's also an incredible amount of hassle. Um, like really? Have, oh yeah, you just told us that. Oh my God. Like you have to have, you have to have the consumable in stock too, right? And that, yeah. that become, and you know, quite frankly, people are gonna reuse it anyway. So like, are they just gonna you know, boil the sheath? And yeah. And I'm afraid, I'm actually afraid that they won't even do that, right? Because I heard, like, in the community setting that we're working with in India, I mean, I literally heard from a collaborator that that's really risky because the chances are they're going to reuse it. I mean, they don't, I mean, it takes a lot of education to tell them don't reuse it. I mean, you might think that they would, but you can't do quality control without adding more money to the process. So that's what we've been struggling with. And I was thinking maybe to here's one idea that as this gets out to say there are two options one is you know seven hundred dollars without one versus you know if you want one it's going to cost more so that people sort of can like it's like with my kids right i never tell them no i always say do you want x or y and then all of a sudden it's like you know they don't have any choice and they're going to make a decision so that was one way of thinking about it because if people are they want more for a very modest price. You know, you can't just do everything. Um, that's why mobile ODT is $4,000, right? Because they have all these bells and whistles that maybe, 
a community health provider doesn't need. And we don't, you know, we have an Android phone. It's like the cheapest Android phone. Uh, you know, we're going to get that in bulk. So we're, we're trying to just drive down cost right. to the extent possible because our goal is not, I mean, we need to be sustainable, but not profitable. Yeah. And, and I mean, I wouldn't, I would keep in mind too that I, I mean, I say this and then you look at mobile ODT and they keep in, increasing the price. But that's the problem. Like, I feel like it's easier to start at a point where you think you're going to be sustainable. And then if you can come down, oh. versus you come up. like I, I'm just looking, I mean, you know, mobile ODT, but I'm looking at like just the Chinese versions and like a. There's a Chinese version? Of the Chinese called Postcode. Oh, oh, um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not a Chinese mobile DT, but just like a basic couple of yep. um, And it's 1200 bucks. What? Um, I saw okay. Me. So we and need to basically know. be below that, right? I mean, are people buying the Chinese colposcopes in the emerging markets? Uh, I think so. Mostly the requests we get are for mobile DT. But um, I, I'm surprised that people buy it when it's $4,000. That's interesting. That's not what they charge in those markets. Oh, okay. But they're getting closer to that. Um, so I guess my point is there's the, the fact that that's happening tells you there's demand, right? That's a good thing. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know how much of it is truly, I, I mean, to the point, like nobody's demanding the other coposcope, but we haven't really promoted the other coposcope. Uh, uh, we, we talk about mobile DT. Um, and I, I think the other advantage of getting these products into market sooner is that, you know, a lot of them are also being bought on tender. So you need to get into, I, I think Mobile DT has probably done a fairly decent job of getting the tender specs written for them. Um, and so, you know, you, you need, like now that there's you know, a competitor that also you know, connects to a mobile phone and can do a lot of the same things, um, like that, People just need to be aware and, and sort of make sure that the tender specs are sort of broad enough to, to be able to, to have both options. Um, so I don't know anything about tender except I know what it is. So yeah. is that something that VIA would help with or do we need to sort of figure out the tender specs like because each country has its own and I actually thought that the bidder like like some okay. distributors essentially you know bidding for that you know uh, product to, to sell the product and our job is just to get it to the to the local distributor but is there more um there's always more um i think uh you know for the most part you're right the governments will write their own tenders but just like you know in dc like if you're a lobbyist you make sure that the next law is written for you um manufacturers do that too okay so you know they will make sure that there are features in there that you know in this case you know, probably, you know, the mobile ODT one might say, you know, it has to be able to record and save the Oh, video. okay. And, and so the Chinese ones don't do that. They're just optical coposcopes. And so they wouldn't qualify, you know, for the tender. So we almost need to find the tender specs for each country then. If they've been written and published. Uh, you know, we don't always get, we don't always get the tenders. We'll just get like, suddenly there'll be like four different distributors who all respond wanting the exact same number of products. Um, we're like, hmm, there's something going on here. Uh, okay. Often with, with like so it could be on a just in time basis, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it sounds like, you know, we're trying to do everything that a colposcope would require. In fact, we're trying to do everything a standard colposcope would do. We're, we're not deviating from that, right? We're, we're basically saying this has got everything that a colposcope in a hospital would have. Um, so, I'm also wondering whether we could drive the price down. I mean, I'm just thinking about it. Like if they buy two for say $1,000 versus one for 700, that's a way for them to address the disposable issue because they could just switch it out. Sure. I mean, you right? offer, I, mean that's, I mean, Dean offers two tips with each purchase. Okay. Right. So that might be another way to get around it. And so it's basically saying to people, you pay up front a larger amount, but you get two colposcopes. And it, instead of us having to deal with this precarious issue of reusing the sheath or, you know, not willing to buy it or not having access to it in time or having to buy it in bulk, um, that this could be a way around that issue. And we just need to, I mean, we haven't 
we don't have a business model around this. As I said, we were just trying to be frugal because our goal was to solve a problem. And like, I've been working with NCI on the AI algorithms and, and you know, they've been very clear. I mean, I think their cell phone idea is don't say this to anyone. It's crap, right? I mean, people that I'm talking to are like, this is, this is not even possible. Like, it's terrible. But, you know, they're like stuck on the cell phone. So they said, we'll only consider the pocket or the cell phone. That was their, and so, but they said, can you make the pocket colposcope $200? I was like, come on. Like, you want me to be the price of a cell phone, but not as crappy as a cell phone? But my point is, I'm using that as a litmus test and saying, how can we come close? And maybe we can't, but if we can somehow still be in a range that the market can bear, then, then that's good. So I think maybe some of these answers can't be, some of these questions can't be answered, but I was just letting you know that those are the things I'm thinking of to avert this issue of people essentially you know, hurting patients because we expect them to have a consumable, and I'm terrified of that, especially in HIV positive populations. But if I know that they have two and they can quickly switch, and that's $1,000, which is still less than 1,200, but it gives them two colposcopes, then, you know. They, they may not, I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel like that's the opportunity. It, it, also a good reason why not to sell it, like those first units. It's like, no, no, we just want you to borrow them. Like, and then we're gonna come back to you and be like, okay, how, like how much would you pay? Like is a thousand bucks for, for one too much, too little? Um, you know, I mean, of course they're not gonna say, the highest price, right? They're gonna obviously want to pay as little as possible. Yeah, but I mean, you could say, I mean, you just said it, you know, like the manufacturer's gonna sell this for a thousand bucks. You know, now that you've used it, would you buy it? Um, they'll tell you. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've, we've tried to get at it different ways, um, but again, the, the competitive set here is all so much more that I get, I, 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 I think it's better to come in at something that makes sense for you okay. as a business. Um, I mean, we see this still with Pumani. Like, I, I think I think Hadley got most of them taken off, but like there were a ton of rice documents where they were like, the Pumani is going to be $400. And it, <laughs> I know. He told me. Yeah. It was really a struggle. Yep. Um, so I want to be very careful. I haven't said anything to anyone, but I have said, you know, in the high, you know, several, you know, less than a thousand, but you know, still like between 500 and a thousand, which is clearly doable because we know what the bill of materials is. We have a good understanding of the cost of goods. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, if you can just send me an email with what you, huh? That could be 999. Right, right. And so I was thinking, you know, if people buy more, obviously that's going to, you know, r reduce the price of each one, obviously a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, giving and them a choice so that they can say, I just want one or two and make, you know, it's like basically sales, right? You buy one, get one free kind of thing, but I'm not a good salesman or saleswoman, but I think it would be good to know for our planning purposes, at least for that initial, you know, few and then 80, what you would like to see from us to get the ball rolling, at least for the 80 that we want to sell. Um, because then, you know, we... Sorry, this wasp loves me. First it was my husband, now it's a wasp. Um, so I think that would help us so that we can say, all right, you, you know, we're gonna have 80 by the end of the year. Maybe we'll even have batches and, and, and I can talk to the manufacturer about those things if I have a sense of you know, what the, the stages are. Uh, nope, that sounds great. So I'm just, I'm making a note. So um, okay. I will follow up with Riza and Jocelyn, who's managing our supplier portfolio. Um, but I think it would be really interesting to get some out to Riza, because like, as the, I the point out, it's become a, an acute pain. Like a lot of people just, for a host of reasons, um, you know, some of these devices are just getting much harder to sell in these countries, uh, price being one of them. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that there's an opportunity here, but um, yeah, and, and I think, the opportunity also to answer some of these questions that you have sort of pre yeah yeah i mean we our prior prior primary goal is to have impact yeah. right i mean that's that's at least 
why we're doing it. And we haven't rushed to market to compete with mobile ODT because we're not driven by profitability, which I know they have to be because they're getting investors and we're grant funded slower, but we feel like we're not beholden to anyone. Um, so, so, you know, different, different aspirations, different objectives, different outcomes. So that's fine. I mean, I, I think people can continue to do whatever they want, but we want to at least make sure we're not a barrier. Is it going to be a Nest product? Like, is it? No, they... no, no, no. We have to. We had to start a company because we actually got a pretty large grant to do this, and it just ended up that we kind of were forced to start a company. But we're fine now. I mean, we're outsourcing to a, a manufacturer. I mean, it's like you, right? It's going to be growing pains, but I'd rather do it right and not, you know, have to. I mean, likely we may not make a lot of money from it, and that's not attractive to other companies. And so we pretty much have to just buckle down and do it ourselves, which is fine. I mean. Yeah. You know, you but, learn as you go. But it won't be part of the, the Nest portfolio of products? No, because it has nothing to do with newborn health. Okay. I thought they were evaluating the mobile ODT too. They are. They like it. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm upset at Rebecca, but what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. People have their preferences. And I think she works with a gynecologist who's used to a regular colposcope. So for yeah. her... Obviously, something that meets her needs, which is similar to what she's done, is more attractive. So I get that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's what people in those communities want, right? So I, I get that. And I'm going to not be stuck with, you know, what people want here versus what people want elsewhere, yeah. right? Because most of the studies are done by us elsewhere. And, you know, who knows whether that meets, aligns with what people want there. Well, let's get them out there and find out. Yeah. Well, thanks, Noah. It was really great talking to you and seeing you in person for the first time. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we've spoken a bunch and, and only this is the first time. Yeah. No, this know. was fun. Thank you so much. I love the interview. I just, I'm trying to learn, but I think that many people sort of see this as very, you know, mysterious. So it's, it's yeah. great to be able to talk about it. Or, or that it just kind of happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tried to make it casual, so it's not a big deal, but we'll definitely send you the video and we'll cut the dogs out for sure. Um, and then I, I'm actually off next week, but I will follow up with everybody and get you that information the following week. That sounds good. Have a great vacation. Vacation, mostly. I have okay, a have fun. Going have fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was nice talking to you. Have a great weekend. Likewise. And we'll talk to you soon. All right, bye. bye.